My name is Jin Young Jin. I'm the gallery director of the Korea Society. And thank you so much for coming for our special event tonight, um, Journey to North and South Korea. And tonight is such a steamy, hot day. And I really appreciate for your interest in our program. And I'll try my best to be a cool host tonight. <laughs> um, Mark Edward Harris is an award-winning photographer and also author of several books, including um, Inside Iran and Inside North Korea. And he has been received numerous accolades from critics and uh, audience, and his photography has been appeared to uh, the New York Times and Los Angeles Times Magazine and Times of London and many um, famous publications. And um, actually, I have known Mark for almost five years when the Korea Society was a uh, driving force in New York Philharmonic uh, Orchestra's trip to Pyongyang back in 2008. Uh, Mark documented um, this historical journey to Pyongyang by a musician and we had his uh, artworks, 40 photographs in our gallery and we also organized a traveling exhibition to American University. And tonight's talk is presented in commemoration of the uh, 60th anniversary of, of Korean War's armistice. And Mark traveled to North and South uh, Korea eight times each, and he documented his artistic create uh, result in a two creative books tonight, uh, titled North and South North Korea and South Korea. And um, I think both book captures the the drastic different realities and the similarities at the same time. And uh, uh, he's going to share his journey to both North and South Korea, uh, especially beyond to reason is cap uh, their ca capitals. I mean, Seoul and Pyongyang is quite know well known through the media, but he will explore beyond that those capital cities. And um, his newly published book will be uh, available for sale tonight after his talk. And he will sign his book if you guys want to have a special memory tonight. And uh, thanks a lot for coming tonight. And uh, let me introduce Mark. And please welcome Mark. Mark, where are you? <laughs> I don't I see you. <laughs> I Thank you, Jin Young. Jin Young is always great to work with. Years ago, in 2008, we worked together uh, to do the, uh, after the New York Philharmonic uh, concert, I was, uh, through the Korea Society, I was invited to document uh, the experience there. And that, to me, was the biggest break in, in this project because uh, one of the, the deals um, in doing that, um, in the New York Philharmonic agreeing to going, was uh, that they could bring in journalists that would be um, somewhat unrestricted. For those of you, and I know a lot of you guys have been in North Korea before, you know, unrestricted is relative, right? But, but when we went with the um, New York Philharmonic, we had a lot more access. And so a lot of the strongest images uh, are results of, of, of that uh, trip, including the cover of the North Korea book. Um, so I'm going to show photos, and, and this can be interactive, so feel free to, to ask questions along the way. So Jin Young, do we have a, a mic you said that we're going to pass around, or is that after? So, Myanmida, wine up say all. Wine juice say all. Kamsamida. Good, okay. I like to keep everybody drunk. It makes a better audience, right? Um, that's the secret, I think. Uh, okay, so, so I'm going to get started, but, but really do feel free to ask questions along the way. So for me, the, the whole project started in 1997. It was my first time in Korea, and uh, but this was for South Korea. And I was able to go up to Panmunjom, which separates, obviously, North Korea and South Korea at the 38th parallel. And um, 
eventually did a story for the LA Times Magazine on life along the DMZ. I called it life and death along the DMZ, and then they, they decided to change it to life along the DMZ for a little bit more positive spin. Um, but if you can see here, and I'm allowed to use the pointer today, so I'm excited. Um, they usually don't let me play with things like this. But right here is the military demarcation line that separates North and South Korea. So this is a South Korean soldier. Here's a North Korean uh, soldier. Uh, at one time before the Axe incident in 1976, uh, in this JSA, Joint Security Area, North Koreans and South Koreans and Americans were allowed to intermingle. But then after this ch uh, tree chopping uh, incident in 1976, uh, they were removed to opposite sides of, of the military demarcation line, and that's the way it is today. So I'll start with the South uh, Korea book. Um, because of the success of, of my first North Korea book called Inside North Korea with Chronicle Books, um, and then working on the second book, the, the South Korean government got wind of that and said, look, you're doing all this stuff in North Korea. Why don't you do something in South Korea? And so I said, yes, I thought that'd be a great opportunity. And then especially uh, because we were coming upon 60 years of the signing of the armistice that stopped the fighting, did not officially stop the war. And uh, so this July 27th uh, will mark 60 years um, since the signing of the armistice. And it was interesting, uh, I, I'm not gonna bother reaching into my pocket to, to pull it out, but I found uh, in circulation a, a coin, a, a nickel from 1953. And, and just to have that tangible thing that this was around in circulation uh, in 1953 sort of connected me to, this wasn't that long ago in a, in a certain sense. And so for, for this trip, um, basically, so Panmunjom, we saw a, a, a photo a minute ago. A lot of fighting was done around here. Um, traveled all the way down here. So you'll see photos from this area. This is where the national dog from uh, Korea is, the Jindo dog. Uh, Yosu had a, had a World's Fair, and a very famous aquarium is there now. Busan, uh, up Homigoat. I wanted to get to Dukto, which, was an, which is an island that's in industry in dispute between the, the Japanese and the Koreans. And, um, but after six hours on, on the ocean, uh, they turned the boat back. Uh, it, there's a very high percentage for people that tourists that wanna go there, they get turned back because of rough weather. Um, and then in 2010, in November 2010, um, young Pyongdo was shelled by the North Koreans because of the war games that were going on. The North Koreans uh, feel that the uh, demilitarized zone should basically be along the 38th. A and it sort of winds up around here and it's not, the maritime part of it is not recognized by the North Koreans. And so they felt the US and, and South Koreans were getting too close to the line. They warned that they were gonna do something. Um, and then they started shelling the island. Um, and the rules of engagement have changed since that engagement. So I, I, I had to wait, and eventually I got on a hydrofoil from Incheon and then went to Yongpyeongdo. So this is uh, North Korea now, and so for those that... Uh, thank you very much for saying that, thank you. This is South Korea now. Sorry about that. So this is South Korea now, and, and you can see, I mean, obviously what a, a, a modern megatropolis uh, it is, um, and all the lights on at night, that's a big thing everybody likes to say, oh, you know, North Korea at night, you, you know, it's it's dark if you look on the map. But uh, anyway, this, this is from the uh, end tower uh, looking at the city. Uh, but one of the first things I did when I got there is I wanted to sort of do a, a, a pilgrimage to the tomb of King Sejong the Great. How many people here know um, who King Sung the the great is. Okay, so King Chang, he's the one who invented, or under his reign, the Hangul writing system, which is the phonetic writing system that really brought writing to the masses. And so here's a guy who's known for the good he did for his people, not for wars or, you know, victories, defeats over enemies. Uh, a very impressive guy. And so this is his 
uh, burial mound, and he's actually buried with his wife. But next door is another king, and he had his wife buried separately because he felt he didn't want to spend eternity with her. So maybe that's a good litmus test. If you, if you really love somebody, you should, you know, get buried in the same mound. Um, so this, this is obviously Sai, right, who did Gangnam Style. And I really got into to K-pop, and I felt it was important as part of the South Korea story to photograph some of the celebrities of South Korea. And so I don't have them all uh, in this presentation, but Sai is obviously at the top of the, the heap these days uh, with, with his song. And here's uh, K-pop. This is from, there's a lot of, uh, it's really gone global with Mnet Countdown, uh, and other programs uh, on TV uh, that people are, are singing and dancing to the songs without knowing the lyrics. But I, I, I think it's uh, pretty catchy. And obviously Taekwondo, uh, the um, martial art of South Korea, has really caught on. And baseball. And I actually, it, it's more fun in a way to go to baseball games in Japan and Korea. Uh, anybody can guess why? Cheerleaders, thank you very much. See, everybody can guess, but they're too embarrassed to guess. But no, cheerleaders, I think it brings so much energy to a game. I mean, I love Vince Scully. You know, I'm from L.A., but still. I think cheer a cheerleading section at a baseball game is a lot of fun. Uh, and that, so I'm doing, I do a lot of work with Corey M, which is a Korean-American magazine. And so my, the next issue, the next cover is going to be on Ryu, who's pitching for the Dodgers now. And then Kim Yuna, who won the gold medal in Vancouver, who's now in, next year was Sakcho in, in Russia. Um, no, it's not Sakcho, that's in South Korea. But what's the name of the place in? Um, Sochi, sorry. Thank you, Sochi, in, in, uh, in the Soviet, uh, former Soviet Union in Russia. Uh, but she was amazing. This is in London, Ontario, and she was flawless. Pretty, pretty impressive. And then one of the key things for, for the trips, the last two trips, I've been to eight, eight times in North Korea, eight times in South Korea. I really tried to be even-handed. Um, but the opportunities for hiking, for um, adventure sports, for temple stays, is really pretty, uh, is, is pretty fantastic. And so this is uh, climbing over a suspension bridge between two rocks rock outcroppings, and um, I made my 29-year-old assistant go first, and I, I figured he can, uh, I guess that's me, sorry. I, 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 I had him go up first. I figured he's 29, he can carry the backpack. Um, this is an abalone farm in, um, in the very southwest corner of the country, uh, Yosu, which had the World's Fair. Uh, but what's been left behind is the um, aquarium, which is really a world-class aquarium. Uh, and this is from the Temple Stay, uh, one, one of the hermitages associated with one of the temples, which is really something I would recommend. Uh, temple Stays, uh, for people in the tourist industry, uh, I think is, is they've really developed to a very high level in terms of tourism, where they have brochures in English. Um, but the experience is, is really great. And so this is one of the hermitages, as I said. Uh, kimchi, which, um, does anybody know the story behind kimchi, why it's spicy? Who, who knows why it's spicy? It's actually used to be mulled kimchi up until the Portuguese, and the Portuguese brought in red peppers, and that's when it became spicy and hence the red peppers in the next shot. Uh, this is uh, near Pohang, which is on the west coast, which is where people typically leave from to go to Dukto. And so since the, the ship was turned back, um, I was able to use more time there to photograph. And so I always try to turn a negative into a positive. It's like, okay, I, I didn't have a chance to, um, to get to Dukto this time. We're stuck here for a couple of days. And so I really tried to work shooting, you know, South Korea off the beaten track. And so um, this just very quiet, you know, very few tourists get to this area. Um, 
the fisheries uh, or the eateries along uh, the uh, boardwalk that faces the ocean uh, was good for photos. Um, this is uh, a pretty sexy building, I think. Wouldn't you say? Uh, I guess I'm into buildings, but um, but I think the design of this is is uh, pretty neat. And this is also in Pohang, uh, some art there. Uh, that was for the World's Fair years ago. It was built for that, so it's sort of an observation deck. Oh, and so this also resulted from not being able to um, to go to um, to Dukto. This is in Homigot. And so South Korea is known as, as the land of the morning calm. And so this is where the sun first rises on the, on the Korean peninsula at Homigot. And so th this is the Hands of Harmony um, sculpture. And so there's another hand that's on land. But I just did a long exposure so the water just sort of blended together. But the, it like doesn't look like clouds. And, and this is really the result of not being able to do something. And so when I teach photo workshops, it's always the same thing. It's like, just don't sit there and say, oh, I couldn't do this because you, you have to make um, something out of, you know, if something doesn't pan out. Uh huh. Huge, huge. I have some shots that have birds landing on the fingers and I was debating which one to use and I ended up deciding to use just this clean one. But you, you could get three birds, three, three seabirds landing on each finger pretty much. So, so pretty huge. Um, that's a good question. Um, probably just you know, a, a third of the way up toward the wrist. I mean, pretty small. It's a huge thing. And so some people on, on a bright sunny day try to get the thumb and, and the finger, the forefinger together to sort of pinch the sun. But I kind of like this sort of surreal kind of feel uh, for the lighting there. And, and this is uh, a calendar sort of really stopped in time. This, this is young Pyongdo that was shelled in November uh, 2010. And, and the people there, we did some interviews through a, a I, I speak some Korean, but n n no way in the world can I do a, um, uh, an interview. Um, but we talked to somebody who ran a nursery school there, uh, somebody that lived in this neighborhood. They were very upset by, by the, uh, res the slow response, of the South Koreans. At, at the nursery school, they said, the only way they found out that it was not a misguided shell from the practice was a parent called up. And so they th then they ran into a, a shelter. So, and, and that missile missed the nursery school by 100 yards. If it had hit the nursery school, I don't know how a, a greater war um, could have been averted from that. I thought that it was a, like an Not at all. Oh, no, no. Four people were killed on this island. And shells just landed arbitrarily, uh, destroyed a lot of houses. It's amazing more people weren't uh, injured. Uh, and so this is a house that the shell just came right through the uh, the roof and just landed out on the road. So, so really, I mean, if an occupied place, especially you know a nursery school, had been hit, um, and, and now they've changed the rules of engagement. So if the same thing happens again, uh, they don't have to wait to get a, a command from from Seoul anymore. They can retaliate immediately, and and, and the potential. I mean, I, fortunately, a lot of the rhetoric has died down since May, but with situations like Young Pyongdo, if that happened now, we're going to see a different response. Uh, and this is back uh, from during the Korean War days. This is a former uh, communist uh, headquarters that is now technically the the DMZ, the 38th parallel, sort of weaves up and down, and so this was in North Korea, but now this is part of South Korea. And I, I was able to get uh, military uh, approval to go into Taesondong, which is the only uh, North Korean, I'm sorry, South Korean village allowed in the demilitarized zone. And so they're under 24 hour guard uh, right here, you can see. But what's amazing is you see the mechanized way they're planting rice, where when I went along the Chinese North Korean border, there were mules, you know, being used, you know, beasts of burden, you know, hundreds of people doing the work that this guy can do, you know, in a relatively short time. 
Oh, and in the background, I should point out that there's a, there was a competition for a while between who, who could make the biggest flag. And so the, the North eventually won that battle. Uh, and they hoisted a 600-pound flag. And the South Koreans decided that this is as far as they could go. And so they let the uh, North Koreans take this victory. Uh, and so this is in, in uh, Taesung Dong as well. Uh, and so these two, there's about 212 people that are uh, residents of the village. And their rice is actually known to be great rice and really prized. Uh, you know, part of it might be because it's produced within the demilitarized zone. Uh, and so then now we head to the, the North Korea book, um, which every single shot was much more difficult to take. Obviously, in South Korea, there's a freedom to do what you want, go where you want to. Uh, on the other hand, uh, because of the difficulty in, in making photos in North Korea, um, and because it's really off the beaten path, every photo is sort of more special in a way. So there's a, there's a balancing act between the two. Uh, but this shot was difficult to get uh, because I, you tend to have uh, minders with you when you're traveling. Um, and I was able to during, this was during the uh, New York Philharmonic uh, performance in 2008. I was able to, to get out of the performance, uh, the rehearsal rather, and then get down and photograph this. It, it's hard to really see on the screen this particular shot, but um, from a technical point of view, for those that are interested, I had a handheld flash, a little bit of a warming gel to reduce the shadows on her, on her face. So, so basically the area that I've covered in North Korea, um, and, and a lot of people say, oh, but you know, you're just, you know, you just had a chance to go to Pyongyang, probably you didn't really get a chance to see what, what North Korea is really like. But I've really, over eight trips, had a chance to explore as much as the country as I possibly can. So uh, Pyongyang, Sunan, uh, down here, Kaesong, over here to uh, Kumgangsan. And I also did cross Kumgangsan from the south when you were allowed to before the South Korean woman, um, a tourist, was killed and they closed down. She was shot by a North Korean guard. Uh, we drove all the way up the coast, Wansan, Humhang, Hamhung. I uh, went up to Mount Chilbo, Chojin, Rajin, Tumengang, uh, Sanbong, came all the way here. And then Yanji, which is um, in the Korean Autonomous Zone of China is where I started um, one of those trips to get down here. And this is really an incredible area where, where they're experimenting. It's sort of like China in the, in the early 80s where they're trading cigarettes. And, and it's sort of a black market, but it's sanctioned by the government. And, and the entrepreneurial spirit is something that I didn't see anywhere else in North Korea. It was really something to see, the energy there. But it was, it was really a throwback. Uh, you know, a 30-year throwback. Um, also Mount Baekdu, which is a spiritual homeland for all Koreans. Uh, I also went up to Mount Myohang and, and this area here. And so this, this is a view from my hotel uh, in the early morning hours of, of Pyongyang. Subway system. So they do try to show you, whenever you go there, they do try to take you to what they want you to see. Uh, and then slowly but surely, uh, you're able to sort of get through that and, and pictures like this, which wouldn't be particularly cared for to show, but I think to show human life, which I think is helpful for everybody to, to see. And when you come into Pyongyang, typically you, um, uh, Westerners are not asked to bow at all, but to just be respectful when, when you go see. It used to just be Kim Il-sung, and now that Kim Jung, I mean, Kim Il, it used to be just Kim Il-sung, and then when Kim Jong-il passed away, now he's got a statue there as well next to him. Uh, and a military parade was a real coup. Maybe I shouldn't use that word for this, but it, it, it was, you know, to, um, to have the opportunity to photograph this. Just by chance, we, we got stuck. This was um, for Kim Il-sung's 100th birthday. And this is now where uh, the two leaders that have passed away live in state, or they don't live in state there. Lie in state, thank you. English comes so hard to me these days. Um, 
And so this is the, the Arirang mass games. How, how many people here have been to the Arirang games? Did you go there? Amazing spectacle. No matter what you think of North Korea, the fact that they can put this on. Madeleine Albright commented upon that. Uh, so this is what it looks like before the games start. All, the, all these kids have placards. Uh, very severe penalty uh, if you hold up the wrong one. I don't know if that's true or not. That's, I'm making that up. Uh, and so these are all kids holding up placards. And, and, and this is not a special effect with photography. When I do documentary work, I don't change anything. But this is just the color gels they're using over the lights. But obviously, monuments are the big things. And I'm going to be going to Namibia later this year. Nam Nam Namibia buys their monuments from North Korea, which is sort of unusual. And, and it is interesting that Namibia also happens to have a lot of uranium. So you, you wonder if there's a tie-in so, some, somewhere there. Um, but this was really the, the big opportunity to go with the New York Philharmonic. And so this is Maestro Moisel leading the Philharmonic. A and this is pretty incredible to have a North Korean flag share the stage with an American flag. Uh, that was really a highlight. 2008 and the Philharmonic was, was really a time when people really felt things could go in a very positive direction. Then soon after that, the nuclear issue came up again and things really descended. Then obviously, for the first five months of this year, they really descended. Um, but during the Philharmonic's day, uh, we went to the Pyongyang Music Conservatory and uh, the New York Philharmonic um, violinists and, and celloists and, and it was a, a percussionist gave master classes, which is really beautiful. The the interaction, the interchange was was beautiful. So, they played. I, Lauren Mizell joked that um, they played Gershwin, and I'm trying to remember if it was Rhapsody in Blue or an American in Paris. And he said, you know, someday maybe we're going to be back here and we're going to play an American in Pyongyang. Uh, but they, they I'm glad, that's an excellent question, by the way. They, they finished with Ari Rong. And so Ari Rong is, you know, the national song. Everybody agrees in Korea on, on, on three things, I would say. They, they agree, or maybe four things, but four is bad luck in Asia. So, but they, they agree uh, on Dukto Island, that that should be Korean. They believe that ki kimchi can cure every disease in the world. Um, and they think Ari Rong is the most important song. Oh, and, and, and Bektu is their spiritual homeland. So I would say those are the, I'll have to come up with a fifth because we don't want to end on four. So you have a fifth one, by the way, we should come up with a fifth yeah. one, yeah. So, so this is the Pueblo. This is the ship that was captured in 1968 off Wonsan um, that uh, was obviously an international incident. The, the sailors were kept for almost a year I believe um, North Korea basically wanted an apology and an admission that it was a spy ship. And, uh, you know, the guys were tortured. Um, and so I went and I visited with the, the, um, the crew members themselves. And so I did portraits of them. Now, the commander or captain had since passed away, but this was his wife. And these are the crew members at a reunion. Uh, none of them have been back. Most of them have no interest in going back Where did you I, in Vermont oh. at, at a, um, at a reunion. Um, and you know, the very famous thing where they all gave the Hawaiian sign, they called it, uh, they wanted to protest silently, uh, in a quiet way. And so they, they posed for a Christmas photo because the prop propagandist propaganda in North Korea, they wanted to show, you know, that they're being treated well. So, so one of the sailors says, Oh, in, in uh, Hawaii, um, this is the symbol you give to show Merry Christmas, and, and he raised his middle finger. And since we're being televised, I, I won't do it here, but he raised his middle finger, and so that picture was sent out. Um, and so then when, the, when, the, when that ran, and then the, the North Koreans got wind of what that really meant, they were severely punished for that. So, so they were always trying to resist that. So this photo might look not much, but in, it actually carries a, a lot with it. It's, it's a North Korean soldier on the deck of the uh, Pueblo, which I think was the first American ship captured since, um, since the, the wars against the pirates 
in the uh, Tripoli area back in what, 1796 or something like that. So this is the shot that, that really uh, was, I feel is one of my strongest shots from the, the whole experience. And these are the sort of shots that are not too thrilled for you to, to get out. But I, I, no matter what I do, I always try to be respectful. I'm not there to, to um, I mean, if I, whatever I see, I'm going to try to photograph. Um, but Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, was, I had an 85 millimeter lens up close and personal. And actually, I asked her grandmother if it was okay, if I could take a picture. So I try to be, you know, respectful. Uh, this is out in a park on a holiday. Um, Pyongyang. They, they actually are excellent bowlers. And Roxana, no offense, my friend from the uh, North Koreans are much better bowlers than the Iranians. I, on the island of Kish, I went to an island when I did my book inside Iran. It was the noisiest bowling alley I'd ever been to. People were throwing a ball overhand down the alley. It was just... Was that in the hotel? This, no, 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 it's not in a hotel. Oh, yeah, there is one in that hotel, too. That's a very small one. This, this is actually very close to um, where the Philharmonic played, um, across from where they have the, the big flower um, memorial, the Kim Jong Il, because you know Kim Il Sung, Kim Jong Il, they have their flowers named after them. Um, you, you know, that's an excellent question. I, I heard that 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 there's a little bit of effort to try to get some baseball going. Basketball is a very big thing, uh, and 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 uh, uh, and football or, or right soccer is huge. Uh, but they're really excellent bowlers. Uh, I've got to say, this is, you know, the 100-story hotel, which is finally getting up and running. It should open either later this year or next year. It was closed for a long time because the cement settled, and they couldn't get the elevators up, and so they brought an Egyptian team in to try to, to fix it. Um, so this is Kaesong. So now we're out of North Korea. I'm sorry. We were, we were out of um, Pyongyang. We're out of the capital. Uh, and this is Kaesong. And somebody joked that in North Korea... Uh, you should win a prize if you could get hit by a car. Uh, but that's really changing. There's a lot of people now. Um, there's a lot of cars in Pyongyang, actually. Not so much out of Pyongyang. Things, Pyongyang is still the showcase, that's for sure. But this is Kaesong. Uh, this is Kaesong at night uh, for the 100th anniversary, 100th anniversary party. A waiting room in Tumgangsan, which is, the, um, which, is the, which is on the border of Russia, China and North Korea. Uh, there's not a lot of action going on there, I gotta say. Uh, but this, this is uh, Tumen Gang. I should, not Tumen Gang, Tumen Gang, I should say. But this is daily life. This is what I'm really interested in trying to, to show as best I can. And this is the hotel bar. I, it, it's... Um, their architecture is interesting because when I was 18 or 19, I went to the Soviet Union, including Siberia. I've always been interested in sort of the off the beaten track sort of place. And um, the architecture is similar uh, in a way, and a lot of it is Soviet architecture, except that the North Koreans love color and they love uh, neon lights and various colors, things. In fact, maybe that's something I should photograph more next time. Uh, schoolyard. I guess we have fighters here in schoolyards, right? Mm -hmm. Did you also feel that the South Koreans also like the color? Because I lived in this one hotel in the middle of somewhere in Southern Korea, and it was like loud and well, it was like a little psychedelic night. Yeah, it's a psychedelic nightmare. I, I feel much more in the north than the south. Maybe because there's more power. You were there a couple of years ago when, I don't know if there was as much power. Sometimes they go through it, but North Koreans love neon. and But, but yet it's Soviet ar architecture, but with a lot of neon. Uh, so waitresses at a hotel. So this this is this is a photo that w when one of the people that w was escorting us wanted me to erase it, but um, fortunately it didn't get erased. What? Uh, they f they really don't want to show anything that shows them in a negative light. Um, but you know how can I show? 
stuff like this? How can I do any sort of report like this without getting it? And so you sort of you sort of pick your battles. You know, there's things like, like when we were driving by on a bus and all these people were working in it, in it, they had blocked off a river and they were trying to get silt out of it. And it would have been an incredible photo. And there was just no way they were going to stop and let me do it. And so that is frustrating. So there are frustrations. Uh, but you talk them into letting you take that one. <laughs> well, I, I didn't exactly talk them into letting me keep it. It just sort of get got kept in a way. I, I hate to say. Uh, <laughs> well, just you know, every night I would I would copy stuff onto my computer because they also do sometimes check your computer when you leave the country too or, or not your computer but they check your hard drive and they're pretty savvy too like if you have a i was stuck for a couple hours once on the chinese north korean border and and a guy came out after half an hour and says how do you unlock these i mean that's pretty good on a on a nikon f3 the guy knows you know that i had locked it and he wanted me to unlock them so um but they were already backed up so this is more like they take you to nursery schools to to see this sort of thing uh this is the sort of thing they don't really want you to see. Um, this is more like it. But I, I really think I'm doing them more of a service by showing as close as I can to the reality. Uh, this is at the, um, an, in, near Bektu is where Kim Jong-il uh, was supposedly born. Uh, in reality, he was born uh, in the Soviet Union, but, but uh, they have him born in the shadow of Mount Bektu, which this is, which is really a spectacular place. It's the highest caldera uh, lake in the world. And well, Kim Jong Il was born uh, in in the shadow of of Mount Bektu. Kim Jong Il was, yeah, nineteen four during the Korean uh, during the World War Two, yeah. Uh, but this, um, the the Chinese side, which is over here, so right down the middle of the lake. Uh, China and North Korea, it's, it's split. But the Chinese, it's amazing the industry they've made it. They have jeeps just flying up and down uh, the slopes. It's actually pretty scary. And then you have like half an hour to run up to the top and you come back down. Uh, and then you've got an hour in a gift shop, you know. And fortunately from the Korean side, it's very quiet. You go up there, you hike, you just, you know, you, you get to experience it. There's hardly anybody up there. Um, but th th this is um, the Angmuk River, which is also known uh, in, in the West, we know it as the Yalu River, which played a major part, of course, in, in the Korean War. Um, MacArthur was told he could only bomb the southern half of this bridge. And so his comment was, you know, how do you fight a war when you can only bomb half a bridge? And so this was really the beginning of end when, when Truman eventually fired him, uh, you know, with the troops coming up toward the Yalu River, and he ignored... The, the, the the Chinese through the Indian ambassador had said, "Stop moving up above. You got your you got your land back, or above. You know to the 38th parallel. You keep coming up. We're going to get involved." And so they sent 900. No, no. They sent millions of volunteers in to North Korea, and they really pushed them back. And 900,000 were killed. I mean, it was really human waves. Of uh, Chinese, but anyway, so this is a this this um, bridge is still there like this today. This is Shinuiju, uh, which is in the background there, and people say they've never seen that merry go around um, or Ferris wheel rather work. I, I don't know if it's, that's true or not, but but the bridge is still there as a testament to what happened. And it's amazing because Dandong is a very modern city just across this very shallow um, or, or very it's not wide at all um, waterway, and there's actually tours. Uh, that they take you right along the border uh, in the boat. So this is now Pamunjan. So now we're coming back to where the whole thing started when I was in Pamunjan in 1997. Um, this is uh, now on the North Korean side. But in order to get here, even though it's just, you know, right here where I was standing before, you know, to take the picture, I had to go back to Seoul, to Beijing, you know, to Pyongyang, and then drive down from there. Um, every blue moon is one or two people, who, who, diplomats that get to walk through. Uh, but this is a good view uh, of, um, of Pomunjan today. So once again, there's that demilitarized, the, I'm sorry, the military demarcation line that splits uh, Pomunjan and, and basically travels 150 miles, not a cement line, but, but a line with markers. Yep. 
The, these are our, our meeting buildings for the UN representatives. Um, so they have a, a Swiss representative and a Finnish re representative. And they used to have a Polish representative, but now that it, it's not part of the, the other side anymore, I don't think that the, the Polish uh, representative shows up anymore. So they have meetings to discuss protocol. Uh, and once in a while there's meetings. There was a hotline there. Um, I don't know if that's been reinstalled. Uh, now the only difference between that picture in 1997 and now is, is you, they're wearing helmets instead, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but supposedly that does represent a heightened tension that they have you know, um, helmets on now. So that's officially it. Uh, questions, anybody? Yeah. Oh, sure. I was just wondering if you could explain the ax incident. Oh yeah, so, so the, that's an excellent question. And I'll do it the best I, I can. Um, in 1976, uh, in the Pamunjan area, uh, there was a line of sight issue between two uh, U.S. South Korean or U.S. outposts, and so the uh, soldiers were dispatched uh, to trim the tree so they could get a straight line of view because it was obscured, and so they couldn't necessarily know what's going on out there if, if it was ever an issue with the North Koreans. And so they started uh, trimming the tree. Uh, the North Koreans uh, showed up, and, and they said, "Stop doing this! Don't we don't want you to do this." And a fight ensued, and they grabbed the axes from the Americans, and uh, two Americans were killed in the incident. And uh, Kissinger wanted to retaliate, uh, but this remember 1968 was right in the middle of the uh, in the Vietnam War. I'm sorry, this is 76. So the, the the Vietnam War had ended. We had just gotten out of there, um, and so there was not much enthusiasm. To now, all of a sudden, we're finally out of Vietnam. Let's now get involved in this. Uh, and so they um, had Operation Paul Bunyan instead. And Paul Bunyan, basically, they sent a contingent of, of, of martial artists and South Korean martial artists and Americans with clubs, and they chopped the whole tree down. So that was Operation Paul Bunyan. Where was the tree exactly? The, it was right in the DMZ near the Bridge of No Return. And you can actually go online. To, I should have had a picture to show you. It, it's, and, and the axe is actually in the museum on the North Korean side. It's kind of a morbid thing there. Another question, good question. And also the, the, the Pueblo, I, I should say the Pueblo incident happened partially. We, we were spying, or the US was spying. Uh, I think personally they, they should have just admitted it, why not? And what they should have said is, yeah, we're gathering information because you just attacked the Blue House and tried to kill the president of South Korea. Why shouldn't we try to figure out what you're doing? You know, so. Could you please talk about the approval process you went through to photograph? As I assume you yeah, did yeah. a more um, you know, involved process than your average tourist does who goes into North Korea, given that you're producing all these books. So could you talk about yeah. the bureaucracy and the process? That, that's that's a, a good question. And, and I, I can't give you a full, full answer uh, just because I'm, I'm doing more stuff there and there's some people that could have a problem. Um, but one of the main things... Uh, was really what opened the door was working through the Korea Society uh, to get permission uh, to go with the New York Philharmonic. Uh, and then once I did that and they saw that I was even-handed, uh, the process has become much easier. Because what happens so often, I mean, you see like, you know, Lisa Ling, and I always get this confused. Am I right with Lisa Ling? Laura Ling, rather. Well, Laura Ling was, but her sister, Lisa Ling, went in with the doctors. And she did a, right, right, I think, she, and she went in with doctors, and, and she actually showed on a National Geographic special or whatever, how they were hiding a camera, a bigger camera, in the suitcase, and actually showing that in, do, in the documentary. Well, every time that happens, that creates more trouble for somebody like me who's trying to, you know, do it more, you know, I mean, she did it a legal way. Roughly, but but doing that sort of thing. But her sister, who ran across the border, right? She goes, "Oh, you can't touch me because I just ran back onto the Chinese side." It, it doesn't work that way. I mean, she was lucky she wasn't shot, right? I mean, that's what happened to the South Korean tourist. I mean, it's a serious thing out there. Uh, but basically, um, to get approval, I mean, there is a UN 
representative. It's a new person now who, who I don't know. Um, but I, I, th I think, I know we have a couple other people who went not too many years ago. You were there, what year did you go? Something like that. Depends how you, you go. You know, you can apply for something if you have sort of an other job too. That's one way to go if you really just want to explore it. You know, yeah, if, if you just put journalist, then you're going to have to get into a much more complicated thing. There's ways, you know, to do that too. Um, but it's never easy, I got to say. It, it takes work. I mean, I'm up for something else now, and, and we're, but I want to bring in uh, more cameras. We have this bigger thing we want to do. And so I have people in Beijing that are helping me in, in North Korea to try to get this whole thing going. But um, it's, it's probably the, one of the most difficult places to get in and work. But actually, once you're there, it's not so bad. But if you feel like you're going to you know, upload images that evening, that's going to be tough. Except for the New York Philharmonic time. That was interesting. That was amazing. They actually had the technicians there. They, they set up a conference room, and we had internet access. We were able to feed stuff out. Uh, it was amazing. I don't, you know, I don't know how they did it. So they have the technology. They have an intranet there, not an internet, but an intranet, you know, for local things. So they're, they're pretty savvy. Other questions? Uh huh? Is the money going to be for the Chinese candidate? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a good person to give exact numbers definitively, but from what I understand, and I've looked at different numbers, I, I believe there were 900,000 killed. That the most, yeah, the most soldiers killed in the Korean War were actually Chinese, uh, which is an interesting fact, right? Now there were more Koreans killed when you take the, but in terms of soldiers, 900,000 were killed. I mean, that's an incredible number. But it was the way they fought, too. They, they didn't fight with heavy artillery. It really was more the human wave kind of thing. And, and you're going up against, you know, the new jet fighters and, and uh, heavy artillery. And, um, you know, I wish I could say in a definitive way, uh, I don't know if the people were volunteered by somebody or um, if there was genuine enthusiasm and these people were volunteers. That, that's a very good question. But they're considered volunteers. I mean, that's, that's the Chinese term for that. That's a good question, too. But that has been quite uh, classified information for a long time. Yeah. Uh, but that's reaction. Well, now uh, it's pretty... Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that news is out. You can easily look that up. You, you, thing that that came out, those numbers, yeah. And, and then there were different numbers about the U.S. numbers of killed. Do you guys know that sometimes you hear 36,000, something like that? But I mean, if you just think, but what about all the, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of civilians that were displaced and killed, and then the use of napalm, you know, for this, just, uh, and, and North Korea was leveled in South Korea, obviously. You know, when you have the capital changing hands back and forth, it's not going to fare too well. So um, I, I, I'm sure all, all wars are devastating, but that one in particular. And, and I do think, you know, when you hear the rhetoric out of uh, South Korea, or North Korea rather, that they could turn Seoul into a sea of fire, I do believe that. I don't believe, you know, hopefully it's not going to happen. I mean, but they would have the technology. They would then lose, of course, in a war. But they have, with their standard artillery, and, and Seoul is 35 miles away, you could you could really have some uh, pretty horrific uh, situation there, but in, in terms of the end, you know they're not going to prevail. But but at what cost? And so, uh, I mean, the biggest question that I don't have an answer for, and, and I think that's the problem for everybody is is uh, how does this thing play out eventually? I mean, it's sixty years so far. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. So you know, that's that's you know, will we be here? you know, in 10 years discussing the same thing. I mean, who knows? I mean, the first five months of the year really did seem like something was going to change, didn't it? I mean, with Kim Jong-un, you know, and, and his statements. But um, hard to say uh, what, what the future is. You know, it really, I, I actually had changed my book. The intro had a more positive spin on it. But, it, you know, as I was finishing up the intro and 
beginning of this year and everything was going on, I started having to lop that off, you know, and then eventually it was just a machete and just, you know, that whole last paragraph for the positive thing uh, just wasn't applicable for that. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, I've got the microphone now. Um, from your experiences, we have this idea that the North is very, you know, it's like a blackout, information blackout. Yeah. But do you think, I would assume, that they're still able to consume the South's pop culture, K-pop, Psy. I mean, it's got to be making its way in somehow, right? Or not? I have no, I have no idea. Uh, I don't think it, it particularly makes its way in there. Uh, I think that uh, they get Russian TV, and they see a lot of things that are much more open now. They see commercials. They see things that are going on. But in terms of South Korean and, and Psy and K-pop, I, I would say that hasn't particularly penetrated. Though their sort of music, they like kind of poppy music too. And so you, you have bands almost everywhere you go playing that sort of poppy kind of thing. But in terms of really having it, I mean, they're, they're much more educated and aware of the outside world than I think we often give them credit for. But I think things like K-pop, uh, nobody's playing Gangnam style anywhere. You know, just just not happening. So they, it's, they still really are excluded. Uh, you know, maybe the upper echelons, you know, gets a hold of some things. But I would say in general, no. Um, that really could be looked at as decadent, maybe. So, uh, If I may ask one more question. Sure. Um, you've done such a great job. Um, I've got both your Inside North Korea and Inside Iran Oh, books, thank you very much. And I think they're both fabulous. Thank you. Um, this this you, North Korea one's much better now. Though. Re return the old one. <laughs> oh, I've, I've, bought, I've bought the new one already. Oh, okay. um, have you photographed other countries or are thinking in future about going and doing such in-depth work anywhere else? I mean, you've done such a great job of these countries. I'm just wondering if thank you can. have thoughts about anywhere well, else. Well, I did do in Japan. I love Japan. And so I did, you know, a very different type of book. I wanted to do something on Japanese culture. Uh, and I did The Way of the Japanese Bath about Japanese hot springs, which is something that's still very real. It's something that's a part of the culture uh, the, the, and, and what the water symbolizes and all that. And so that was very in-depth. Um, but because of that, I also then, uh, when the tsunami happened, as soon as I could get over there, I went over there and, and, and covered that because I felt I shouldn't just cover the, the good. You know, this is part of the story, too. And I had been to the Tohoku region where, where that happened uh, just a couple of months before. Actually, because of you, by the way. Thanks a lot. You put me right there. Um, we actually did a story up there uh, in, in that region, which is a beautiful area, very rugged uh, coastline, beautiful coastline. But um, And it was hard to believe that. And that was like early December. And then in March 11th, you know, the, um, the tsunami happened, which was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen. You know, the aftermath of that, the twisted metal. In fact, my friend Yoshi that I traveled with said this is – what Hiroshima must have looked like. I mean, just the metal, the, the power of water uh, can't be underestimated and what it did to hundreds of miles along that coast. That, that is definitely the most uh, possibly overwhelming thing I ever saw, just the endless hundreds of miles. But the fortitude of the people there was really impressive. Um, and so, yeah, I have, you know, I did work in Myanmar. I was in the Becca Valley shooting for a while. Uh, I definitely like places off the beaten path. Um, I'm not sure what's what's next exactly. I'm sort of just sort of waiting through that. My friend Roxanne and I are talking about possibilities and things of other places. It's always great to explore. I am going to go to Namibia. My friend Arnie, everybody here, you know, later this year. And so you never know what that's going to lead to. You start off somewhere and then you know, maybe you're going to catch something right there and say, you know what, I, I really want to explore this more. So I think that's how it starts, starts to incubate, and then, you, you know, you go from there. Good. Oh, okay. I'm just wondering, where, where could I find your pictures of the Philharmonic tour? Do we have, uh, Jin Young might know the answer to that. Do we, is there a, well, there's, in the book itself, there, there's a picture of the Philharmonic playing, but in terms of the larger, in terms of the bigger body of work, I, do you have that from when we had the show? You mean the photo itself? You, no, no, but do, do we have a slideshow of that stuff or uh, online? I have all the ar archive. I, mean, I can share it all the information. Yeah, so, so Jin Young has that, and I have some. That. Were, you, were you in the Philharmonic on that one? Some of my customers are in the Philharmonic. Oh, that's great. 
That's great. Yeah, because there was somebody, who, and I, I can't quite see out there, but there was a gentleman who actually did a photo book of his own. Uh, I mean, just, you know, just did like a blur book, you know, of his photos of the experience there that was really good. But that really was, uh, was a great experience, I got to say. So, Jeannie, I think that's about it, you think, in terms of any, anybody else? Is there, I can't, a, oh, there's one uh, back there. Uh, yeah, um, the some of the everyday life photos to me had the most impact because uh, it shows. I mean, you have this country that's been demonized in the West, and and it really shows how life there is isn't all that different than, yeah. than it is in other places. Um, yet you had mentioned that your your handlers uh, weren't happy with some of the photos that you took. Right. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, what about those photos was it that they weren't comfortable with? Right. That's a really great question too. Um, well, they're very sensitive. They're hypersensitive because they're used to people taking, you know, make, taking any opportunity to make a negative, you know. And so um, when they see something like somebody who's shabbily dressed, has holes in their clothes, dirt, we're here. It's like, you know what? We still have all this great stuff. Big deal if you want to shoot somebody like that. Um, and so I think there's a there's a hypersensitivity that's that's going on there. And also... You know, unlike here, things can really come back to haunt them. If things get out and then it's traced back to whoever your, your, your tour guide is or whatever, they can really get in big trouble. And so I think there's that element there too, the potential for, uh, because these jobs are highly prized for sure. I mean, you know, if you can get a job as a, as a tour guide and you're trusted to interface with, with foreigners, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. And so I think there's, but, but it's, what's interesting is as time goes on, they get more relaxed with you. Uh, and that's what I've really found. If, if you jump off the plane and you're just, you know, a machine gunner shooting everything you see, uh, you're going to have issues. But if you just sort of take your time and you start developing, and who needs to really shoot, you know, a thousand frames an hour anyway? You know, you just sort of pick your, your spots. I think that goes for anywhere. I mean, if you're shooting in a village and, wherever, and you just go in there firing away, people are going to react, you know, in this way. But if you just go in and, and you interface with them a little bit, and so I think, and, and I appreciate you saying that about that daily life and human interest, I think that's how you get photos that mean something. And that old cliche about, you know, eyes being a window to the soul is really true for sure. I mean, definitely. That's, that's when you really have a relationship with somebody. You don't have to speak the same language to, to, to click on that level. I think for sure. Can you talk about oh, sorry. A well, this one, uh, as I said, was really tougher to get than it seems. And, and you guys should see the original uh, of this print. Um, it, it did take, you know, walking out the back exit while the Philharmonic was playing so I could be out on my own and finally get to the place. I had the camera underneath, it was ice cold anyway, but it was good, you know, I didn't want to particularly show myself out there. Um, and I did carry a handheld flash that, I, that was attached by a, a wire so I could hold off to the side so I could, since it was, you know, a time of day that you wouldn't necessarily want to shoot a person on the street, but because I could sort of clean it up with the, with the flash, uh, that helped. And then the timing of the blue bus in the background that worked off her uniform worked really well. So sometimes things really work, just just all come together. Uh, it's amazing how it works, photography. I mean, you have to know the technical end of things, you know, to get the shot in the first place. But but there's also something else that happens. And I always try to treat um, my frame as a canvas, my sensor as a canvas, you know. And I look at the whole picture. So whether I was conscious of this blue bus coming by, I tell you the truth, I can't really remember. But um, that's sort of the way I, I approach it. And I tend to, just like a lot of people who shoot more street photography, if we only had one lens we could carry with us, it would be a 28 millimeter lens. That are two, like what Robert Kappa said, you know, if your pictures are not good, you're not close enough. You know, you get up there, you get in there. You know, the stand back with a long lens, you feel a distance. And people are aware you're shooting like that too. And it doesn't create any uh, relationship at all. So, you know, this might have been like, you know, roughly a 28 millimeter lens kind of thing. So I was right there in her, you know. But now maybe I couldn't do the shot because there's a lot more traffic in Pyongyang. So who knows? Okay. So thank you, Jin Young, for uh, having me. Thank you, everyone. I hope that everyone enjoyed. And I think we can continue our conversation with him casually. 
um, with drinks. Great, let's do that. Yeah, uh, let's to add that point, that was one of my favorite photos as well. So we use for the PR oh, thank you. photo for our exhibition back in 2008 as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, and and uh, and I and thanks to Jin Young also for helping coordinate this and making this happen. It's if not for her, this wouldn't happen for sure. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.